want to welcome you to interview number 22 of the new series, My Dramatic Relationship with a Narcissist. We're welcoming Christian, who's an old, old face around the channel, to tell her story about the next case that she's been involved in, be involved with. And, you know, every story is different. Every story is unique. And I'm very interested to hear what she has to say. So, hey, lady, welcome to the channel. Hi, Miss Deborah. How are you? I'm fine. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, too. I hey, missed my, you. <laughs> my giant head. So I was like, tell us, you oh, know, let's get started. Let's get started and tell too. everybody about what, you know, what motivated you to want to respond to my call for guests and share your story here. Well, you know, there are certain things that I went through that I feel other women can relate to. And um, I also understand that you're trying to reach the younger crowd of women. And I feel like if I can give some advice um, to the younger women that maybe I can, you know, prevent them from enduring what I endured. Because nobody gave me any advice at all. No one told me what red flags to look for. You no know, that is just the theme. That's just the overwhelming theme. It's like these parents, what are you doing? They're like turning all these young ladies out into like, you know, college or into the workforce or whatever and not telling them anything. It's just like setting them up to be victims. Exactly. And, you know, especially when you grow up in a dysfunctional household, with parents who are abusive to you, verbally, physically, um, there's also molestation in your household. Um, I was not taught to have a very high opinion of myself. Um, I was called ugly, fat, nasty, disgusting, stupid. You know, uh, I was told that because of my weight, nobody would ever love me, nobody would ever want me. You know, and I was constantly being put down. And because of the way that my parents treated me, I had this deep yearning to be loved and accepted. And I think I wore that on my sleeve um, because I had this, this mentality that, you know, if my own parents don't like me, who else is gonna? And I felt like there was something inherently wrong with me that maybe I was this terrible, ugly, disgusting person. And therefore, I used to go out of my way to try to win people's approval. Um, I recall putting up with things that you should not put up with just for the sake of having people like me. So I we're not would, talking about just relationships. We're talking about people in general? Well, people in general, but also relationships as well. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, overgiving, overextending myself, um, and just... I was also under the impression that being treated like dirt and being treated poorly was part of love because my parents wait, wait, explain would, that explain that what, what what my parents would treat me like that but then at times they would tell me that they loved me oh i see so i thought that pain and love went hand in hand and i felt that being mistreated was normal Ooh, Lord have mercy. So you, that's what, that was your early childhood experience. At what age did you start getting interested in boys? Um, when I was in high school, but, you know, I had a lot of problems with my weight and I got made fun of and bullied in school a lot. And, you know, I couldn't get a boyfriend. Um, so when I met Miguel, my son's father, I was 19. He was 31. Oh, <gasps> yes. He, all it took for him to reel me in was for him to tell me that I was beautiful. And 
I thought he was cute, good looking, tall. And I kept thinking like, wow, like what would a guy like him ever see in this chubby girl like me? You know, and like looking back on that relationship, he laid it on really thick. Um, and I, I guess like he could tell that I had low self-esteem. Um, you know, like you said, these narcissists, they're predators. Um, and, and it's like, I don't know how they're able to do it, but they're able to sense when you don't think highly of yourself, they're able to sort of like pick up on it. Mm -hmm. You know, they can smell it. Um, you know, so it was like, you know, of course he would shower me with compliments and tell me I was beautiful. And he started buying me flowers and taking me out to the movies and all this other stuff. And I just, I was so caught up in that and taken by because no guy had ever done that for me before. And we were dating for like six weeks and he asked me to move in with him and I moved in with him. What? Yes. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. That's how much of, of a fool I was like, for him. Thank you old kid come on now don't beat yourself up that hard you're a 19 year old girl that was thrown out there to the wolves essentially like naive with your eyes big so what are you gonna know girl is like you were like a little lamb exactly and i mean you know i i remember people telling me you know well you're lucky to have him because he's so good looking and you're overweight and, you know, so you better do everything to make that relationship work. People actually said those words to you. Yes. Not kidding you. Including his mother. And his mother knew you were only 19. Yes. Okay. I'm just, you know, I want to make sure I have all the facts. That's it's why I'm asking. It may seem like a silly question, it's but okay. I don't want to assume anything. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'm just like on fire right now, but anyway, let's proceed with the interview. Okay. Right. So you meet this guy, you move in with him after six weeks, and he's like love bombing you. Yes. So now that you move in, what happens? Um, Within about a month um you know well at first when i moved in it was like all lovey-dovey and you know uh he would be like rubbing my back and you know buying me flowers once a week and taking me out to dinner and always telling me how cute i was and you know how um i made his life more beautiful and then it was like um you know, oh, God, he made a comment about my weight out of the blue. Um, we were at his mother's house and, you know, I hadn't eaten all day and they had made dinner. So I ate, you know, a plateful, not like overeating, but you know, he made some comments that, Oh, you, you know, you hoovered that down, you know, you're like, you know, suck that up like a vacuum. And I'm just like, well, I haven't eaten all day. And he goes, yeah, you look like you're starving too. And I'm like, what is that supposed to mean? And he's like, well, look in the mirror. You know what I'm talking about. And oh boy, okay. So I'm this like, is two months. Okay, six I'm weeks. Like, one month. Well, this is less than two months into the relationship. Yes. And he goes, "Oh well, you know, you you know what you look like." And I'm like, you know, I felt like this big, so I remained quiet. When we got home, I talked to him. You know 
he's trying to cuddle up next to me and all this other stuff and, you know, trying to get some eggplant. <laughs> and I kind of pushed him off of me. And he goes, what's your problem? What do you have this attitude for? And I said, you don't remember what you said to me at your mother's house about me inhaling the food? And he goes, oh, you're still stuck on that? I'm like, you hurt my feelings. He goes, by, by what? Telling you the truth? I'm like, you, you chastise me for my weight and then you want me to have relations with you. I'm not in the mood to do that. And, you know, he started arguing. He goes, oh, well, you know, you're being a drama queen and you're sensitive. And I knew when I met you that you were going to be a drama queen. And that kind of set me off. You know, I was letting him know. I'm like, you disrespected me. How do you expect me to react? Well, he kept calling me fat and, you know, started getting nastier and nastier as the argument progressed. So finally, I told him, I said, you know what? I may be fat, but your attitude is ugly. You got a gap in your teeth. You know, um, your breath stinks. And, get it, girl. You know, get it. Uh, it's like. I was just, I was, I said some other things, some, you know, colorful language. I'm trying to keep it clean. Yeah. But, um, you know, he ended up, you know, he called me the B word. And I said, you know what? If I'm a B word, your mother's a B word. And that got me punched in the face. No. Yes he started to physically um, abuse me. Um, he would tell me he was sorry, you know, like a couple days later, he bought me a diamond necklace and told me he was sorry and that he didn't know what came over him, that his temper got the better of him. But then he also goes, oh, but you pushed me to do it, you know, with what you said. And, you know, you made me hit you. And had you not said what you said, I wouldn't have lifted a hand to you. And, you know, you got to be careful with your mouth because, you know, I don't like a woman talking to me like that. A woman is supposed to not say, you know, those things. And I, I said, but you attacked me first. And he goes, Kristen, don't start. You know, and it was just like, after that, I remained quiet. You know, fast forwarding to a couple years into the relationship, I find out that he's cheating. And I also found out he had children he did not tell me about. Um, and I confronted him on that. He felt like he didn't need to tell me those things. He had told me that I didn't know, I didn't need to know everything about his life. And I, I told him, I said, you know, how is it that you can expect us to have a relationship when you are not honest and forthcoming with me? Um, you know, and then when I confronted him about all the other women that he was sleeping with, he goes, you're just a drama queen. You just don't know when to stop. And I'm like, you're cheating. You say you love me, but then you cut me down for my weight. You say you love me, but then you go out and you sleep with other women. And, you know, we got into an argument about that. The argument progressed. And then he goes, well, all you are is mad at the world because your mommy and daddy abused you. And, you know, you're lucky that I'm with you. I could have any woman I want. I've got lots of women that love me and they're not fat and nasty like you. Woo. And he's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cause I would have had to go and get me the, the nearest oh, object. Oh, but you see, I was a pick Misha during those days. I was a pick Misha, and this was before I had started watching your videos and before I went into therapy. 
And so I was blaming myself for a lot of things. Oh, you poor little thing. And here you are, what, about 20 years old? Yeah. Yeah. And just, um, you know, I got pregnant with our son, Raphael. And throughout the pregnancy, you know, he was very distant. Um, and he would make excuses that he wasn't attracted to me because my belly was getting bigger. The day I gave birth to our son, he was there, but like he was there physically, but not really there mentally. Like, you know, he would, he would be watching TV or texting his friends or, uh, you know, on Facebook or whatever. You know, and when I said something to him about that, he wanted to accuse me of being a drama queen again. That was the first, like, like that was like that in, in criticizing me for my weight was always his go-to thing. You know, I could not tell him about my concerns without him accusing me of starting drama, without him accusing me of being oversensitive, overdramatic. And it made me feel invalidated and, and not heard. Um, I remember after giving birth to our, our son, um, he made a comment. He goes, well, now that you're not pregnant, you don't have an excuse to be fat anymore. You need to work on losing weight. And this was our. I'm about to lose 195 pounds right quick because I'm out. Deuces. You know, <laughs> that's what I should have said. That is what I should have said. But, you know, me being in the state of mind that I was in, I wanted to do everything I could to hold on to him. Right. Because I looked at myself as the problem. I looked at myself as the bad person, or, you know, and I felt like, oh my God, you know, I'm lucky to have him. You know, no guy has ever wanted me before. And uh, just. That sounds really, really, really painful. It is. And then, you know, our son was killed when he was three. Um, a hit and run accident. I was at work and. My son's father, Miguel, was supposed to be watching our son. And our son was outside playing in the front yard, and somebody was fleeing the scene of a crime, and they drove up on the curb and hit my son. Oh, my God. And our son was left outside unattended. And I later found out that Miguel was inside the house talking on the phone with some chick. And Miguel left me to deal with our son's death by myself. He, within two weeks of our son dying, he decided to get married to somebody else. I had to take care of the funeral arrangements by myself, deal with the grief and the depression by myself. He didn't even show up to our son's funeral. I can't even think of enough bad things to say about that man. Who does that? That's like the lowest form of humanity I could even think of. Girl, I'm sorry, Christian. I'm sorry. I know that it still hurts. You're a little baby. Um, so how many years ago was this? Well, I had my son. I was 25. He died when I was 28. When I was 28, I'm 36 now. That's my son would be long. no. My son would be uh, 11. I'm so sorry, Kristen. Thank you. It's not your fault. Um, I went through a lot of depression. 
I also have post-traumatic stress disorder, not just from the domestic violence that I suffered, but also stemming from childhood. Right. And then the loss of my son. And, you know, I, I inherently thought something was wrong with me. And it took a near suicide attempt before I finally decided to go into therapy. And I went into therapy seeking answers, seeking to ask the therapist what was wrong with me. What did I do wrong to deserve all of that? And it was in therapy that I found out that I didn't do anything wrong to deserve that. And it was in therapy that I, you know, and then of course watching your videos that I learned about narcissism, men who prey on women, the love bombing, the gaslighting. I learned that him calling me a drama queen all the time was, it's a form of gaslighting. Oh, of course. So you try to validate your feelings like you can't be upset about the stuff that he does. Because that's drama, whereas you just have regular, normal feelings and reactions to his crap. Right. Exactly. Um, he also would talk a lot about wanting unconditional love, and but he never like reciprocated that. And I, you know, after watching your video on unconditional love. And then also through therapy, I realized like that, that concept of unconditional love, it's a fantasy and it's a setup by the narcissist to, like you said, get you to put up with all kinds of BS, tolerate things that you should not tolerate in the name of love. And those people that demand unconditional love, they're not going to give you unconditional love. The moment that you say something they don't like, the moment that you slip up, they want to they wanna withdraw. They want to take their love back or they want to get ugly with you or get, you know, uh, abusive with you in some way. Ooh, what a nightmare. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm free from that now. As far as my son is concerned, you know, it's always going to hurt, but I just try to think about the three years that I did have him, and I try to be grateful for that because some people cannot have children at all. Now, that's a good point. That's a good, actually a good, healthy way to look at it. Yeah. You know, I know some women who have tried to conceive and they cannot. And I just try to be thankful that I was able to have a child. I did have a son. I loved him. He loved me. I got to be blessed with him for three years. And um, I, I'm not religious, but I am a little bit spiritual. And I, I do believe I will be reunited with him again someday. Did I, they ever I also, um, find the person who hit him? Not yet. They have not. Oh, boy. And, and that, those are know, the days before they had all these, like, cameras around. Exactly. Right, yeah. Exactly. And, um, you know, I'm still trying very hard to uh, work with the police to find out who did it. And, uh, you know, like, yesterday was Mother's Day, and that was a very hard day for me very difficult day, not just because of not having my son, but the difficulties I have with my own mother as well. Understandable. Well, one thing that, you know, a friend of mine does, I don't know if, if anything like this would interest you. She goes to um, nursing homes and hospitals and wow. there's a lot of, you know, people there who um, have kids that don't, Pay them the least bit of attention. And uh, she goes and spends time with them on Mother's Day. And she said that it's, you know, wow. it's very rewarding for her. Um, That's isn't that a good idea? I would have never thought of it. But she likes it and she does that thing where they, they hold babies. 
there's like a therapy, Aww. like a group at the hospital. They hold infants, like premature babies. And she really? does some of that too. And um, she doesn't have any kids of her own, but uh, that's what she does. So. That is so kind of her. That really is. That is so kind of her. So that's how she, you know, feels like she, what's your, her do give back on uh, Mother's Day. I know I was pretty amazed, blown away too, because I had no idea. She'd been doing this for a couple of years. I just heard about it yesterday. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, you have a girlfriend. Okay, so once dude left and got, you know, quote, married, did he ever contact you again? Um, yeah, he did. Um, after, I guess, she filed for divorce and tapped his you-know-what for child support and then booted him out, he <laughs> showed up on my doorstep talking about, oh, I'm sorry, I know I was an a-hole and I know I mistreated you and I'm so sorry about not being there for you and our son and, you know, I didn't do right by you. And then that apology turned into, oh, she's doing this to me and she's doing that to me. And, um, you know, it would be really nice if I just had a couch to sleep on. And I'm like, I had no words. I just shut the door in his face. Man, and he just really thought his shit didn't stink, did he? I know. I know. Like, he really thought that I was that stupid. And I didn't even want to waste my energy on him anymore. I was just, I was in such disbelief, it left me speechless. <laughs> Which I know that, I know that face you probably had on, like. <laughs> like, I was just like, really? Like, are you kidding me? I just did not know what to say. I, I, I just, I didn't even think about it. I just like shut the door and he Who just walked off and I was like yeah. stewing about it for hours. I'm like, I cannot believe him. How dare he really? Yeah, well, he had to try it. I mean, you know, nothing beats a try <laughs> but a no. <laughs> but I just, I don't know who she is. But if I ever meet her, I'm going to buy her several drinks because you know what? I feel like that's karma. That's so how karma. long were they married, do you think? How long did you? I don't know. Like within two years of our son dying, he was at my doorstep. Okay. So that was very short. All right. Well, that's good. Serves his butt right. It does. It does. You know, and I don't hold any grudges or anything, but I'm not going to tolerate being used. So in, a, in between during that time, you were already in therapy before he showed up at the door again? Yes. Okay. Good job, Kristen. Yes. Good job. So have <sighs> you met any other um, narky guys after him? Yes, but, you know, between the therapy and watching your videos, now and now that I know what to look for I'm like on it like the the first inkling that I get that a guy is not being sincere or he's not respecting boundaries I cut him off I don't even waste my time anymore you know um and that's not something I did with my son's father I would set boundaries and I would say I wasn't comfortable with things and he would just keep at me and keep at me till he got what he wanted and I would cave in. Right. You know, and he would say things like, oh, well, there's a lot of other girls that would love to date me, you know. You'd be surprised at how many women would do that for me. And that would make me feel threatened, like, oh, my God, he's going to leave if I don't do this, so I need to do it. I need to give him what he wants. Yeah, and he picked you, girl. Oof. I know. Poor I know. Thing. He, just like he just could, sitting there, just like a strawberry on a bush. Just pluck. I know. Like he could he could see the pick Misha in me like a mile away. That's how they do. Don't feel bad though, Christian. Like I said, you're only 19. Teen. That's still a kid. Okay. Teen anything is still a kid to me. Even, I you know, know, even 20. I mean, that's just like an inch away from being a kid. So 
to me, and they'll tell you like 21 and can legally drink and all that kind of stuff. Well, mm -hmm. then maybe you're kind of an adult at that point. But 19, 20, 18, those, those are still kids. Yeah. He, he knows who is 30 something year old behind had no business to even talking to you. Yeah, but I, I noticed that men do that a lot. Men, older men do tend to target younger women. And I always thought it was because of the way that younger women look, which I think is part of it. But it's also, like you said, a lot to do with the fact that younger women are naive. And so many of us younger women, so many parents are not teaching their daughters what to look for. Yeah, and that's to me, it's just, that's what this, you know, that seems to be the theme. And we keep hearing through all of these stories, it's, it's the same thing. All the girls have been sent out into the world with no knowledge of men or relationships or game at all. And I think mm -hmm. in this day and age, that's just criminal. That's just criminal. It's just, it's just oh, setting it your daughters up to just be used and abused and taken advantage of. It's like, and this is supposed to be a kid that you love? What are you doing? Mm-hmm. You know, I also think part of it is the crabs in a barrel mentality. Like, for instance, my father was not only abusive to me and my sister, he was abusive to my mother as well. She was stuck with an abusive narky dude. And I guess she didn't want me to do any better. So she didn't teach me what to look for. Do you think she didn't, I mean, do you think there's any component there that maybe she didn't know? Or you think she knew and she just intentionally didn't say anything? It could be a pot, either one could be a possibility. You know, it, it, I guess I should have explained myself better. Um, you know, because she had low self-esteem. Looking back, she was a pygmisha. She allowed my father to call her every vile name in the book, put his hands on her, do all kind, you know, throw things at her, all kinds of stuff. You know, and she never called the cops. She left him three times, and all it took for him to get back into her good graces was a lousy, oh, baby, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again, which he did end up doing it again. Ooh, girl. Oh, my yeah. goodness. So one of the things that I want to tell the younger girls, follow your gut instincts. If something tells you that something is not quite right about a person, go with that. Sorry, I apologize. Um, people will lie to you. People will manipulate you. Your inner voice will never lie to you. And I think we as women are conditioned to go against our inner voice because of patriarchy. You know, men want what they want from us and we're conditioned to put men on a pedestal and, and make sure that we give them what they want and cater to them. Otherwise, we'll end up being single that we go against our gut instinct yep second Just guess ourselves and make ourselves be wrong guy. you know it's like oh i shouldn't think yeah that. i you know i'm wrong i should you know i should trust him he didn't mean it yeah, we're like, or, or, oh, I'm, maybe I'm just overreacting or, oh, maybe I'm misinterpreting, you know, maybe I am being dramatic. Like, we are taught to question, us, you know. That's true. So that's okay. So that's one tip. Do you have any others for the, the young viewers? Yes. Um. The first time he violates a boundary, the first time he disrespects you, the first time he puts his hands on you, leave him. Run and never look back. Because if he does it once and you stay, he will continue to do it. Once a liar, always a liar. Once a cheat, always a cheat. Once an abuser, always an abuser. And it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. I agree. Okay? Because they see they can get away with it and you're not going to, they don't suffer at all. They don't suffer any losses, 
any repercussions, everything stays exactly the same. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, a couple other things. Don't allow yourself to be manipulated. That BS of, oh, if, you know, um, like what I'm trying to say is never compromise your morals or your values. Set boundaries and set firm boundaries. And if he says something to the extent, oh, well, if you won't do it, another woman will, let him go. Let some other woman do that for him. That's a manipulation tactic. He's playing with your head to try to get what he wants out of you. Don't let him do that. You know, if you're not ready for relations on the first date, then you're not ready for relations on the first date. And if he's not willing to accept that, he's not the man for you. A man that really truly cares about you is going to want to get to know you as a human being. He's going to respect you. He's going to value you. And if something makes you uncomfortable, he is going to cease and desist. Exactly. He is not, yeah, exactly. He is not going to want you to be uncomfortable. Any man that doesn't mind making you uncomfortable, he's only thinking of himself. And he will continue to do so. And you think that um, this, this attitude that women have where they just accept that is the part of the pick Misha routine? Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I also think that we're taught this kind of stuff. Like, you know, it starts in childhood, the conditioning of catering to men and giving them what they want and competing with other women for men. And then, you know, even I've, I've even had some women say, well, whatever you won't do for him, another woman will. Okay. You know, so it, <laughs> what you, you know, but me? But when it. you're young, when you're young like that and you're not used to being loved, you know, that scares you and you're like, oh my God, well, you know, I'm never going to get another guy like this or no other guy is going to want me. So I need to make sure he's happy or I'm going to lose him. Right. Oh, these people do such a job on girls. Oh my God. Yeah. They do a real number on us and you know, if, if I can spare another young girl from going through what I went through, then that's rewarding in itself for me. Well, I, I love the fact that you came through on the other side. Girl, you have been around the bend a couple of times. <laughs> and it's, um, you know, I'm glad that you oh. had enough presence of mind to get yourself some therapy, though. I think that was probably, would you feel like oh, that's yeah. like the and turning was point? Was that the turning point for you? Yes, it was, you know, and I think, you know, I had spent many years of my life bottling things up and suppressing things and pushing things down and putting a brave face on and pretending to be okay. And then when my son got killed, all of those things that I had been pushing down, it was like a volcano erupting. You know, I started drinking a lot to numb myself out. I didn't want to live anymore. Didn't want to get out of bed anymore. And I was punishing myself. I felt like I was partly at fault for my son's death because I wasn't there to protect him because I was working. Oh, so you were blaming yourself. Yes. I was blaming myself because I felt like had I not gone to work and left him with his father, that maybe none of that would have happened. I, I blamed myself for a lot of things. And as I said, after a failed suicide attempt is when I went into therapy, but I went into therapy thinking that I was the problem, that something was wrong with me. Right. And therapy was the greatest gift I could have given to myself because I found out nothing was wrong with me. I was raised by abusive people, was not taught any better. An abusive man preyed upon me at a young age and put me through hell. And 
they also, you know, my son's death was not my fault at all. I went to work. There was no way I could have predicted that at all. And, you know, it took a lot of weight off of my shoulders. You know, I blamed myself for the way that my parents were and the things that happened to me. And through therapy, I learned none of that was my fault either. That was on my parents, you know, and then watching your videos, you know, I've become stronger, more confident in myself. I set boundaries. I say the word no. I still like help other people, yes, but I don't overgive. Um, I don't overextend myself. And I'm not a pick Misha anymore. Like, I'm single and I'm fine with that. You know, any man that's going to come into my life, I look at it now as, what's he going to do for me? That's right. What am I going to get out of dating him? That's the way you have to do. Because it's like these guys, man, they come in and they just want to take, 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 take. It's like, well, okay, if I'm cooking, I'm doing all this girly stuff for you. What am I getting in return? And I think a lot of women, you know, they feel bad about taking that position. They feel like it means that they're um, like a gold digger or, you know, there, there's yeah. something wrong with them if they want a guy to come in the door, you know, being a provider, being a protector and doing, treating them well. And I'm like, why would you take anything less? What would be the point of him being there then? Right. And, but see, a lot of girls are not taught to have standards. We are taught to settle. We're taught to just accept whatever crumbs are given to us. That is social conditioning. Well, I am hoping, I'm really, really seriously hoping that I think by the time this series is done, there'll probably be about 25 videos in the series. And uh, yeah. I'm really hoping that you guys make like a grand impact on thousands of young women's lives, that they can see what you went through, hear your stories, hear the red flags of warning, see what you did about it and how, how you all came out whole and positive on the other side. I think it's just the best testimony of strength and resilience that we could ever do. And I wanted it to come directly from those who did it. I mean, I could talk about it all day, but it's better coming from you. It's firsthand. Thank you. And, you know, I, Good I job, Kristen. like, the best thing I could do for myself was work on myself and try to be, you know, be the best person that I could be every day waste any energy on him and he's getting his karma right now he's in prison <gasps> what and what did you yeah. do um let's see uh not paying child support and then some issues with drugs and um uh following a 17 year old girl and I don't know all the details, but he's in prison. Well, so, that's probably you know, where he belongs. Eventually. Uh oh, did we lose her? Looks like we lost Christian. Well, we were nearing the end of the interview. Oh, there she is. Is she back? There you Spend. are. You came back. Good. I was yeah, like, what happened? Oh. I don't know. You just like disappeared for a minute. Maybe your internet. So did you. Oh my goodness. Well, you were just, I would, yeah, you were rattling off all the things that he was, was he was uh, in there for. And I was like, well, that sounds like a good place for him to be. Yeah. Very good place. And you know what? It's like, just, I don't like to wish bad things on people, but it couldn't have happened to a better person. Yeah, I am in full agreement. You're going, mm. <laughs> We're on that same page. We're on that same page, girlfriend. Well, Kristen, I don't want to exactly. keep you too long. I've been trying to keep these down to about 40, 45 minutes. You know, let you guys come in and tell your story without draining you forever in two days. But, okay. um, you know, I want to thank you. You know, thank you for being so candid and for sharing such very painful stories. Um, your wisdom is like priceless and i think that um 
people will probably have a lot to say. So be sure to come, you know, visit on the wall and, you know, respond to the questions and comments that people post and, you know, flesh that out a little bit. Right. They usually have some questions that, you know, we didn't talk about or they wanted more information or whatever. But I do want to tell you, great job with getting yourself together, girl, and getting your, you know, Thank getting you. past all of those horrible situations. Good, good job. Good job. Thank you. And I just want to say thank you for being you. Thank you for doing what you do. Um, because your videos and your channel and your advice has helped me a lot. And, you know, I just want to see you continue to do what you're doing to help other women who were like me. You know, well, I, I have I a, got a good two more years in me. So we'll see how long this I can do this before I, my voice starts creaking and I get too old. <laughs> but I'll, I'll but do I my mean, best you, just, you, you I mean I have a lot of love and respect for you and I want you to know that so oh, well, I appreciate it and same back to you so you go ahead and have a enjoy the Thank rest of your you. evening and I will see you on the wall real soon okay you too Deb love you okay bye Kristen bye Thank you.